have been so encouraged and so blessed um, by what we've been going through for the last number of weeks. I was just counting. I think this is like week number seven that we have been considering what it means to know God, as Paul puts it in Philippians, like to know him is the greatest prize. Right? If I ask you one more time what the highest goal is, I, I hope that you know the answer to it. It's to know him. And um, we're going to continue down that path today. Um, and as we gear up for, for altars and what it means to develop a, a culture in our church of corporate worship and corporate prayer for like ages to come, for generations to come, I think this might be the, the, the last space that we focus this intently on what Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 3. So I'm excited for it. I'm looking forward to it. I've been so blessed and encouraged that this has become such a, a, an undergirding of all that we do as a church. To have this amount of clarity in why we're here, it's singular. There's one thing. There's one reason, and it's to know him. Would you agree? And that may not be the, the firm conclusion that you've come to in your life, but I just I want to let you know today that this is the people that you're with. This is, this is what undergirds our church. We're here to know him and to know him better, as Paul puts it. This is our pursuit as a church. But today, in that conversation, you can consider this talk a disclaimer. When we're talking about what it means to know him, as Paul puts it, this is a disclaimer. There's some fine print in this conversation that we need to consider, and we're going to consider it today together. Is that okay with everyone? All right. This is about knowing him as he is, not necessarily as we want him to be, especially when knowing him as he is is in conflict with who we want him to be. So when we say, I want to know him, we're saying, I want to know him as he wants to be revealed. Even if it's at the expense of what I know of him. Even when it challenges all the boxes, all of the spaces, all the considerations that I have put him in the past. When I say that I want to know him, I want to know him at the disregard of everything else. This is what Paul is leading us in. When we sing these songs, I want to know you. I want to know you more. When we say it, when I come up here every single Sunday and say, what is the highest goal? What is the prize to know him? That's, that's a romantic notion, isn't it? Like when Hans is up here talking about wanting to focus on his wife and Tiffany on Hans at the beginning of their marriage, that's beautiful. They want to know each other and grow in that space. And we have that about God too. But often when we sing it or contemplate it, we read it in the word, it, it sits in this place of romanticism. That's why we can sing beautiful songs about it. But what if knowing him challenges everything you know of him? That becomes way more disrupting than it is romantic. That becomes way more challenging than it is encouraging at times. That's why today is a disclaimer. We can't just sit in a romantic notion of what it means to know God. We have to sit in the fullness of what Paul is inviting us into. Because he says, in comparison to knowing him, I consider everything else garbage. And I think he's telling us that that's almost required if we truly want to know him. We have to put everything aside and say, God, I want to know you as you are. And this is where our hearts and our motivation gets purified. We can ask these questions this morning to ourselves. Do I want to know him? Or do I want him to fit in the box that I have known him in? Asking this question clarifies our hearts. It clarifies our motives. We're going to look at this through a few passages of Scripture today. We're going to start in Exodus chapter 3. We're going to read it together, and we're going to pray, and we're going to go. Is that okay with everyone? All right. 
What a, what a um, confronting intro to a message, huh? Now remember that this is in context with six other messages that have gone before, including the one that Brandon preached. And so if you haven't been tracking with us this entire time, get on YouTube, get on the podcast, because there's a lot that's been invested in this space for us to be able to have this conversation today. Is that good with you? All right. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. And this, we've considered it many times before, is after Moses has been in the wilderness for 40 years, after he took his calling into his own hands and made a mess of it. He's driven out of Egypt for 40 years, and then he meets God in the burning bush, and God speaks to him. He says, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I have heard the cries of my people, your people. They're oppressed and in slavery, but I've heard them, and now I have come to set them free. And he says to Moses, I'm sending you. And then we have this great exchange, and Moses is like, who am I that you should send me? And he says, don't worry. I will be with you. And then we see this exchange in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that is with us and in us to bring to attention in us every area that is so desperately in need of you. I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation this morning so that we can know you and know you better. Lord, I pray for rivers of living water in this place today. That you would quicken our hearts to receive your word. You would capture our minds in the way only you can. I just pray for a grace to deliver the word today and a grace to receive the word for all of us. And for those who are online, that they would feel just as connected as those who are in the room today. So we bless you, Jesus. As the head of this church, we say yes to your leadership. We say yes to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tiffany. Can we thank Tiffany for her wonderful leadership today? And so Moses is having this conversation with God, and God is revealing himself as the one who has been with Israel this entire time. The one who revealed himself to Abraham is now revealing himself to Moses. And so Moses has a bit of context about who this God is, but God hadn't yet revealed his name. He was just God who met with Abraham and said, I have this incredible plan to give you children even though your wife is barren. And this nation comes forth out of Abraham. And here's this nation 400 plus years later enslaved in Egypt. And now God again is revealing himself to Moses. But Moses says to God, you're sending me on this journey to these people. How do I tell them who you are? How will they know what God they're following is? This is different for us, right? When we say God, we're like, we we know God. There's one God, right? I grew up thinking that way, right? And when we say God, it's God. Their context was entirely different. Hundreds, if not thousands of gods who had names and characters and symbols and did different things and they, they represented different things. And Moses is like, which one are you? How how should I relay to them where you fit in the category of their worldview? Which one are they going to be able to say yes to as they consider who you are? Where do you fit in the framework of our worldview? How can I fit you into what we have always known? Moses was simply saying this, of all the gods of Egypt, 
Which one are you? And then God says to him, you can tell them who I am. And he says, I am who I am. I am who I am. You can tell them that I am has sent you. In other words, what God is saying to them is I am defined by who I am. You can't fit me into a category that you currently have. You can't define who I am. I have come to you to tell you who I am. Other translations put it this way, I will be who I will be. In other words, your experience of me, how I'm going to reveal myself to you is now the framework or will be the framework in which you can relate to me. You can't put me in your boxes and in your framework. In other words, he does not appease to their sensibilities or fit into their categories. He didn't say, here is a, an easy way for you to understand me, so I'm going to shrink my greatness down into a box that you currently have. He says, I am who I am. If he was trying to convince a group of people to follow him, I think like the right thing, the easy thing to do would be like, hey, just let me fit in this box and then we'll work it out later. I'll let you know. He doesn't do that. He said, I'm way outside of any paradigm that you've ever had before, except your forefathers. How you began. I'm the one who gave you the promise. I'm the one who created this nation. I'm that God. And I'm about to show you who I am. Come follow me. Oh, they had categories. They had gods all over the place. They had Elohim, many of them, multitudes. In fact, the Elohim would show up in their lands and do things. Just as we would consider today spiritual realities like demons and powers and principalities, they had them too, but they didn't call them demons. They called them gods. Spiritual entities and deities that actually made themselves known, and then they would build these images and idols and worship them. Because when they worshiped them and invoked their nature, things would happen amongst them. When Moses came and showed signs and wonders, so did the other people. And God himself was an Elohim. He was a God. But when he came to show them that he wasn't a lowercase e Elohim, he was the uppercase e Elohim, that he was the God of gods. You've had gods your entire life, but I'm about to bust your framework about these gods because there's one God that is above all, the Elohim, the great I am. I am who I am. You can't fit me in what you've known. And I'm about to show you that I'm going to blow your mind with who I am. He is over. He is above. He is beyond. And he is outside. This was the God who presented himself to Moses. But this today is not a lesson in ancient Hebrew culture or worldview. I'm not that guy. I'm not smart enough. I've given you already everything that I know. But we, not them, we have categories of who God should be and what boxes he should fit in. We don't call them gods, but we have paradigms. We have understandings and categories of how he should be in our lives and in our world, don't we? We all do. None of us are disconnected from this reality. Can we agree? And I believe that this is the single greatest cause of disappointment and disconnect in the church. The number one cause. Not knowing him as he is, but knowing him as we want him to be. And then he shows up to make himself known and he says, actually, I don't fit in those boxes. I'm bigger, I'm greater, I'm beyond, I'm outside. All of the uproar that we've seen or experienced in the church and rumors of declining church attendance. Oh, they're out there. And all of the church hurt narratives that have weaved their way into the lives that we live. There is no greater cause of disconnect than the disappointment 
of God not being who you want him to be. Shall I say that again? There is no greater cause of disconnect than the disappointment of God not being who you want him to be. How much frustration have you experienced in life when you felt like God should show up in a way that he didn't show up? You're here, you're still hanging on. But there are many people who have said, that's enough. I'm too disappointed in the disconnect from who I expected you to be and who you showed up to be in my life. But it's not that God in himself is disappointing. No way, not a chance. He is greater than we could ever consider. But we get disappointed when he isn't who we want him to be. This is why the message in Philippians chapter three by Paul is so great. He says, I consider every gain I had actually a loss for the sake of knowing him. I'll give up everything I thought I knew if it keeps me from knowing him as he is. This is the call of Philippians three. By the way, knowing him as he is, not who I think he should be or who I want him to be. Because Paul knows the pain of placing God in a box that he does not belong in. It's painful. Like because of this, Paul endorsed the murder and the persecution of those who saw God as he was. And he said, all my blinders, all the, the categories that I placed God in caused me to endorse the murder of those who saw him as he was. He said, I'm done with that. I'm done with worshiping a God that appeases my sensibilities. In fact, I'll lose all of my sensibilities so that I might know him as he is. There was pain in that space, in that disconnect. Paul was saying, I want to know you as you are. And here's the good news in all of this talk about pain and all of this talk about disconnect and all of this talk about disappointment. The good news is life is actually found in who he is, not in who we want him to be. And so if God is disrupting you in who you want him to be, it's only to bring you into the true reality that is life and life in abundance. His motive isn't just anger that you've misunderstood him. He's not just upset that you've miscategorized him. He's saying the categories that you've placed me in are keeping you from the fullness of the life that I want to give you. This is good news in all of this. Would you agree? There's a book that was written in 2005, and the book was called Soul Searching. The subcategory, the subtitle was this, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. Soul searching, the religious and spiritual lives of American teenagers. It was written by two sociologists. It wasn't just a nice novel. It wasn't this journey to find a, a book a, 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 of, of young people finding themselves. It was a sociological study on the state of, of, of spirituality in teenagers in America in 2005. And the author is Christian Smith, and Melina Lundquist Denton coined this term in the book, moralistic therapeutic deism, to describe the spiritual landscape in America, especially that of teenagers. Now, I was a teenager in 2005, I think. <laughs> Just made it in. This was a, this was a, a picture of millennials, of the the the. the predominant way of thinking in my generation. And they define five core beliefs of these millennials in this term, moralistic therapeutic deism. Number one is this, a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Number two, God wants people to be good and nice and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy. 
and to feel good about oneself. And number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Might this sound familiar? Number five, good people go to heaven when they die. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. And it can be boiled down to these three things. Being good, feeling good, and God's job is singular, it's to take care of us. This was the framework that millennials, people like me in 2005, considered God to be in. Including those who profess Jesus. Including those who had this word given to them every single Sunday. Including those whose home had the pictures on the wall that said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It was those people. Everybody laughing. He's like, yeah, I had that in my house. It's us. But here's the funny thing that no one, not one of them, not one of us would walk around saying, I'm a moralistic, therapeutic deist. We would never categorize. We'd never define ourselves this way. It was simply an observation of the boxes or the framework of how we see God and how we see ourselves in God. No one would define it this way. It's just the reality of the lives that we live. And that's scary because it's undefined. Just is the way that it is. It was an observation on the spiritual realities of this generation. And if that sounds familiar to you, it's because I think we've gotten away with this type of thinking in the church for quite a while that God remained safe in these boxes for a long time, that if you just considered God to be this way, not much is gonna disrupt that, right? Being good, feeling good, and God will take care of us. That doesn't seem so ludicrous. Until feeling good actually becomes God. And being good is not as congruent with the word of God, but more congruent with what liberalism says is good. We start getting our cues from, or I should put it this way, we start getting our cues about who God is from the world's morality. See, when the church had the moral high grounds, when everybody looked at the church and said, hey, I may not subscribe to it, but when it comes to morality, we're going to look at you guys. I don't want to be moral, but listen, you guys have the corner on what it means to be moral. So God can fit in these boxes, right? Do good, feel good, God's going to take care of us. But things started to shift. The church no longer actually has the moral high ground. What the world says about feeling good and doing good has now shifted. The church is not considered on a moral high ground anymore. It's much worse. We're considered a lot worse than that. Let's just put it that way. I don't want to go there this morning. And so the box that we want God to fit in actually shifts, and we then have a dilemma. He's no longer who we want him to be. So all of the people, that being the church, that allowed this framework to to, to house what we thought of God, now the framework shifts. Feeling good looks different. Being good looks different. And so now the God of the Bible no longer can safely hide in that space. And so people are like, I'm not down with the God of the Bible because I want the God that fits in my categories. I am who I am. Not I am who you want me to be. I am and I will be who I am and who I will be. This is the God who introduces himself to Moses. Woo, can we go this morning? I remember having a conversation about wrath with somebody. Somebody that's in this room who shall remain nameless. And when we're considering what the Bible says as the wrath of God, 
This person responded and said, well, I can't serve a God who thinks that way. Well, what we've done in that scenario is place ourselves in the position of moral high ground. Say, the God that I want to serve has to fit my paradigm of what I think is good. Therefore, if he's outside of it, I can't serve him. I don't want to serve him. Well, we do that, don't we? We make our decisions about what we want to do based upon our own categories. Paul is saying, I'm done with those categories. I want to know him as he is. Whatever cost, whatever expense, whatever I come up with at the other end, I know that what he's shown me is good and I want more of good. I'm done with what I think. I want to know him as he is. We all have categories, don't we? So this all, what I'm describing here, has built up to cause major discontentment and disappointment in the church. There are a lot of Christians trying to hold on. I don't mean to God, to that framework. A lot of people are trying to hold on to what they've known of him and they're scrambling and it does not look pretty and it does not look good. We start to see it get exposed we're like, hey, I was with you 15 years ago, but now, man, you are just trying real hard to grasp hold of what you thought of God. That's just as bad. God is disrupting our understanding of who he is. And when we try to hold on to what he's disrupting, it causes a lot of ugliness. And some people go the way of, I don't want nothing to do with that God. And other people go the way of, I'm holding on to the God that I thought was this religious paradigm that I've had for 40 years. My grandparents had it. My parents had it. I had it. There's no way you're taking it from me. And I'm going to go down with this ship. Well, what if God himself is doing the disrupting? And those on each side of that extreme are just waiting for God to disrupt a little bit harder. Waiting for God to shake us loose of the things that we thought our identity was found in. I told you there's a disclaimer. We have to be faithful to the word of God. Paul prays in Ephesians, I pray that the, through the spirit of wisdom and revelation, why both? We need to have wisdom and prudence and shrewdness around how we think of God in this world. But never mind the big sociological implications. I have disappointments with God in my real life, in my marriage, and who I thought I would be in my mental well-being in my health, in my body. I have disappointments with God in, in the ways that I, I thought he would show up in my finances and I'm still not there yet. Never mind the big categories that we can look out there and say, this is what God is doing. What about the ones in our own hearts? God didn't just approach a nation when he approached Moses. He approached a man who lived for 40 years in the disappointment and the frustration and the humiliation of taking the call of God into his own hands and then run for fear because God didn't show up the way he thought he would. We all have paradigms of God. And when he doesn't fit those paradigms, it breaks our heart. Can we just acknowledge that? There's a lot of pain in our midst, a lot of disappointment in our lives, and maybe not just us in the room, but, but, but those who are angry in our families and our friends, about why we still attend church, about why we still praise him, about why we still give. Come on, take care of yourself. God has left us without. He's good. He's up there. He's disconnected. He'll take care of you, but live your life. I needed God to be this. I needed God to do this. I needed God to come through this way. I've waited. I've had faith. I believed. There is real and tangible pain in those places. 
When there's a lot of venom out there about, about church and about God and about life, we have to understand what's behind it. It's pain. It's disappointment. Scriptures say eternity is written on our hearts, which means we all have this desire for God, but when God doesn't fit the desires that we have for life, ugh, we have to be aware of how we're interpreting the pain that the world is walking in when it comes to their paradigm of God. Starting with our own hearts. And that pain has caused us to be disappointed in him. But again, it's not because he himself is disappointing. It's that we at times fit him into boxes that he didn't belong in. Or we fit other things into the places where only God belongs. But that's a message for another day. We'll leave that there. This again is why Paul says that knowing him as he is, is the highest goal. There's no other goal except to know him and then life finds its place from there. Because knowing him as he is saves us from the pain of him not being who we think he should be. Knowing him as he is saves us from the pain of him not being who we think he should be. This is why the famous interaction between Peter and Jesus is so profound. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, it says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But he says, What about you? Cool, everybody's got a paradigm and worldview. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am is? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? And we see through the book of John that as he walks with these disciples and he shows up to different festivals, Jesus reveals himself as the one who said, I am. He reveals himself as I am. He says, I am the bread of life. And when the Hebrews with this worldview, these stories would hear the word I am, they're like, wait a minute, he's talking about the one who showed himself to Moses. He is claiming to be the one who showed up. So Jesus says to him, who do you say that I am? He says, I am who I will be, and nothing you can do can change it, but what matters in the equation is your understanding of who I am. I will be who I will be, but what's at stake here is you knowing who I will be and who I am. This is a powerful question from Jesus, and it might just be the most important question for you and I in our lives. Who do you say that I am is. And then Jesus says, you're blessed, Simon, because you've correctly identified who I am. You're blessed because you see me as the Father wants you to see me. You're blessed, young man, young woman, because you're identifying him as he wants to be identified. This is the blessed life. 
This is where all blessing is found, to align your understanding of who he is with who he wants to be, with how he's been revealed to be. This is where all blessing is found. It's why Jesus says to Simon, you're blessed, not because you got the right answer on the test. You're blessed because what your heart is saying is true about what Father is saying. This is where all blessing is found. This is powerful. Knowing him as he is, is the truest and greatest source of blessing you could ever find in your life. It's not just the highest goal. It's the highest goal because it's the highest blessing. This is important to remember, hang on to this. So the idea of being, being good, feeling good, and it's God's job to take care of us is a complete lie. It's a deception that seems pretty and innocent. But when Jesus says, you're blessed not when you consider me to be in these boxes, you're blessed when you consider me to be as I am, we have to understand the deception of a worldview or a paradigm that says being good, feeling good, and it's God's job to take care of us is a complete lie. It's gonna lead you down a path of discontentment, disappointment, and destruction. And who's gonna be left on the outside when you're through that path? God. It's a lie because it puts us in the category of God. I define what is good. I define what a blessing is. I define what his role in my life should be. And if we're in the place of God and he doesn't fit our image, that's pain. That's hardship. That's disruption. That's discontentment. And you can track back every source of pain and disillusionment to that one place where we thought he should fit our image when in fact we were made in his image. And this is all where it began in the garden, by the way. They wanted to be like God. They saw the fruit as beneficial for wisdom, good to eat. They, 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 they liked what they saw and they wanted it. And the serpent said, hey, God doesn't really want good things for you. He's keeping you from good things. And what he's keeping you from is, 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 is knowledge. What he's keeping you from is understanding. And he knows that if you take this fruit, you will be like him. That was the deception of the human heart from the beginning of time, for us to be like God. But now, again, we would never define it that way in our lives. But functionally, that's what's happening. We want him to be in our image. We place ourselves in the category of God. Knowing God as he is, is the very definition of life. I'll leave that one there. And here's some more good news in what we're talking about today. Jesus loves to reveal himself. Oh, this is the greatest news this morning. That he's pretty obsessed with revealing himself. It's the Holy Spirit's full-time job to reveal Jesus. It's the ark of all of scripture to reveal Jesus. It's the Father who gave Peter the insight to know who Jesus was. The Father is pointing to Jesus. Every spiritual reality that's found in him is pointing to Jesus. He loves to reveal himself. This is what he's all about. And he's especially good at revealing himself in disappointment, in doubt and in pain. Oh, he's really good in those places. He said, I didn't come for those who are all put together and healthy. I came for the sick. Not just the bodily sick, the ones who are sick in their emotions. Sick of doing things in ways that bear no fruit. Sick of being frustrated with their own end. God said, I've come for those people. I've come for the disappointed, the disconnected, the disillusioned. I've come for those in doubt. I've come to reveal myself in their doubt. This is good news. 
But if he's so good at it, why do we still struggle in this place? There's a conflict here. It's hard for us to know Jesus as he is when he can only, in our eyes, fit in the category of who we want him to be. He can't land in our hearts the way that he wants to because there's other things that cloud those spaces. We've already made up our minds about him, so it becomes hard to see him as the father reveals him to be. But here's some more good news this morning. He's also an expert in this place. Right after Peter's confession in Matthew 16, the next scene, Matthew 17, verse one, it says, after six days, Jesus took, him, took with him Peter, James and John, the brother of James, and led him up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. What a sight to behold. They see Jesus in his glory. Then here comes this hero, Moses, and this other hero, Elijah. Can you imagine this scene that is playing out in front of them? these literal childhood heroes, these patriarchs of of their faith, right there in front of them. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And look at this next line, while he was still speaking. This great idea about how to honor Moses and Elijah alongside Jesus. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Exclamation point. Not just, hey, I'm suggesting you listen to him. Listen, let me clarify for you what my intent is for your life. And I'm going to yell it at you. Listen to him. I know you love Moses. I know you love Elijah. But while you're considering how to honor them, I'm going to stop you in your tracks. And I want you to listen to my son, Jesus. Doesn't even let him get through his idea. Says, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground. Listen, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them and said, get up, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Now, this image that we see here of of these boys going up the mountain with Jesus, like how exclusive, like they must be the ones that got him figured out. Peter was the one who just confessed Jesus. And they're like, yeah, we got it. We got this ticket into exclusivity with Jesus. We're going up the mountain, all these things. Jesus transfigures before them. He's seen him in his glory. And then here comes Moses representing the law. And beside him is Elijah representing the prophets. And they're beside themselves. We don't just get Jesus. We get Moses and Elijah. We're pumped. This is amazing. Let us honor them. But the scriptures tell us that the law and the prophets served one purpose. It's the same purpose as the Father, and the same purpose as the Holy Spirit. It's the same purpose of the ark of all the scripture. Moses, Elijah, the law and the prophets served one purpose, to point to Jesus, to reveal Jesus. But in the time of this story, Peter, James, and John, The interpreters of the law and of the prophets didn't point to Jesus. They actually became gatekeepers that actually kept people from Jesus. Those who interpreted the law and the prophets were saying, we have the understanding of who God is. And when God actually showed up in Jesus, they said, you don't fit our paradigms, our understanding of Moses and Elijah. So you're out, you're on the outside because you are disrupting what we have in front of us. 
All of our economy, all of our law, all of our community is framed up and with our understanding of God. And here they show up. And Peter, with good intention, but a misplaced reverence for God, says, I want to honor the law, and I want to honor the prophets in the same way that I want to honor Jesus. In fact, let's keep them around. And God, with his voice, interrupts him and says, no, 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 no. They serve one purpose, and it's to point to him. So what God was doing wasn't just interrupting Peter. He was interrupting the religious ideas of the day. Because the religious leaders of the times had paradigms for God, as they said. But they actually didn't reveal Jesus. They kept Jesus from being revealed. They placed a box around the Messiah that Jesus didn't fit in. They actually kept people from seeing God. The predominant religious narratives They didn't point to Jesus. They kept people from Jesus. And what does God do to step into this space? He blows it up. He says, I'm not going to let you put my son in a box. I'm going to shake you. And you know what it says their response was? They felt face down, terrified. Not just terrified, but all the feels, all the emotions. They're not the only ones that God does this to. This is not a story that's hidden in the text for us to look at and be distant from. This is a picture of how God relates with us. This is how God relates with his church. If there are things in your midst, ideas, that keep Jesus from being revealed, I'm not okay with that. Not because my pride is antagonized, No, because I want you to see him as he is, because life is found in him, not just ideas of him. But you know what? It left them terrified. All the emotions, disappointment, discontentment, this isn't just a picture for them, this is a picture for us. And sometimes God does this in a moment. We come to a church service like this and God's presence comes and it reshapes our heart and we have a moment of repentance and say, God, I saw you wrong, now I see you right. Those are beautiful times and I live for those moments, but sometimes this interruption is seasons where God shakes and disables, he challenges. Might it look like the last two and a half years that we've been walking through that God takes seasons to say the things that you've built up in your life and in the church have only served to keep people from Jesus. And now I want those things to fall to the ground so that I can reveal Jesus. But we have to understand our human condition in it. We don't often attribute that to God. We attribute that to government. Or dare I say, a country We're so obsessed with finding out why our world is disrupted when in fact God is saying, hey, wasn't that that disrupted your world? It was me disrupting your world. To serve one purpose. What's that purpose? To reveal Jesus, that we might know him as he is. Not in categories that are safe that we put him in. There were too many things that occupied the space that only Jesus belonged in. And might that be true of the church? That Jesus in this time is shaking us globally because too many things are in the place that only he belongs in. I think that's a healthy way to look at it. Because the space that he wants to reveal himself to you in is a sacred space. It's a holy space. It's a space reserved only for himself. And we accumulate things in life, ideas, concepts, emotions that occupy that space. And God's saying, I'm good with that because I know how to deal with it. But when God starts to deal with it, we become terrified. 
Jesus is jealous over that space. The space that's been filled with other desires, other ideas, other walls. While he was still speaking, the father interrupted him. This is a picture of how God breaks down the walls we place him in and breaks into the spaces that only he belongs in. And then he says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And these are painful moments in life because our worldview gets rattled, but these are clarifying moments in life. These are some of the most beautiful times we could ever get in life. When God clarifies, this is what I'm about. And what I'm about is Jesus. Because what God tends to do is offend our minds so that they can get to our hearts. And he has infinite resources to do so. He strips us of our assurance of him based on false fronts. That was too good to not have a response, so I'll say it again. God strips us of our assurance of him based on false fronts. If we're assured of him based on ideas that are inferior to him, he strips us of those. That's a painful space. All the things that I thought you were saying, God is saying, hey, those weren't based on me. Those were based on the religious paradigms that you adopted from the generations before. And he strips us of them. And then in that space, we lose our assurance of him. That is a terrifying space. But again, he's an expert in that space. Because God frustrates our plans and ideas to give us Jesus. There's nothing more important in your life. Hear me. I can say this quite objectively. There's nothing more important in your life than the revelation of Jesus Christ. Who he is. And when we have ideas about him that are keeping us from him, God is liable to break into that place. Jesus, verse 7, it says, When they are face down, terrified, on their faces, Jesus came and touched them. He doesn't get in, just get in there and shake. He gets in there and shakes. We're emptied. And then Jesus comes and he touches us. And he says, get up. Don't be afraid. He starts to heal those spaces in our hearts. This is what God does in the space between who we think we need him to be and who he actually is. There's a condition of the soul that Jesus delights to reveal himself in. Frightened, angry, in doubt, he is not afraid of these spaces, nor should we. In our own hearts or in our friends' lives, we need not be afraid of these spaces because he isn't. He walks right up to them, touches them on the shoulder, and says, don't be afraid. And then this is it. This is the climax. Verse 8, when they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus. This is what God is doing in his bride, in the church. He's clarifying our vision. Not all these extracurricular things. When they looked up, after this frightening shaking, after this humiliating interruption, Jesus touches them and they look up and all they can see is him. What a vision for his church. What a vision for his bride. Not just for the church, for our own lives, for our marriages, for our workplaces. Is God not still who he is in all of the shaking, in all of the disruption? If it serves the purpose for us to see him as he is, if knowing him is the highest goal, then maybe we should think differently about the interruptions in our lives and about the shakings that come and the emotions that come with it. Father is revealing Jesus so that we can know him as he is not just how we want him to be. I am who I am. 
Ben, you guys can come. As a church, it's not our job to keep people from being disappointed in Jesus. As a church, it's not our job to keep people from being disappointed in Jesus. It's our job to point to him as he's been revealed to be. That's our job. If there's any talk of revival in churches, it's not going to be a revival of signs and wonders. It's not going to be a revival of miracles. Because what's the point of a sign? To point somewhere. It's going to be a revival of the revealing of Jesus. A clarifying of who he actually is. Of the great I am. This is what he's doing in his bride. We place many things in the category that belong only to Jesus. And I believe he's using global events and even disappointment in leaders, disappointment in church structure. He's using all of this to shake us to the place where we're face down on the ground, terrified so that Jesus can come and say, don't be afraid. Let me show you who I am in your pain. Let me show you who I am in your suffering because... You've had this paradigm this whole time, and I had to free you from it. I had to shake you loose from it so that I could show you what you actually want, which is to know me as I am. I was walking yesterday. There's moments that I have in life where Let's just put it this way. They're differentiated moments. They're moments that are clarifying. And I came back from Guatemala about a month and a half ago, and I used this language when people would ask me, how'd it go? (laughs) What happened? And I would say this. I feel like God introduced me to myself. I feel like I now know who I am. I feel like I've stepped into maybe a shadow of the clarity that Paul has in Philippians chapter 3, that there's a singular pursuit of my life. And the pursuit of my life is to know him. You could have guessed that. But I also have come to the conclusion that there's only one thing that we're called to as a church, ultimately. One thing that needs to capture our attention and our vision the revelation of Jesus Christ. That I'm compelled and constrained by my calling to point to him. There's nothing else that we could get up to that would override the call that we have to point to him, to know him as the church. God is reviving his church. The revival is the knowledge of God, the awareness of Him. I've heard many people over the years describe themselves as a revivalist. Like, I'm a pastor, I'm a father, I'm a friend, I'm a revivalist. Well, that's great, that's nice. But how is that differentiated from the only call that we have? We have one call as a church. We have one call as a people of God. Jesus is actually the revivalist. Jesus, when these people were on their faces, tapped them on the shoulders and revived them. But what happened before the revival was something had to die. If we understand what revival is, it means that God first has to show us that something has to die. And then Jesus steps in and revives it. He's done this all throughout history. And he's doing it again. And what we get to do is understand that this is what he's up to. So that we can speak, this is who Jesus is. Because God now uses his church. If we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit being in our midst, the Holy Spirit has one primary job, and it's to point to Jesus. 
So our call as the church is to surrender to who he is, not to who we want him to be. And that is a new level of surrender. Whatever the cost, whatever it looks like, whatever it leads me to, whatever it disrupts, I want you as you are. I don't want to be God. You can be God. So Jesus, I ask you in these moments that you would reveal yourself to us by the Holy Spirit. That we would not get bitter in the places of disappointment, discontentment. Lord, that you would take us back to the places in our lives that you have revealed yourself to us, that those would be anchor points for us. Lord, I pray that this call prophetically through the word of God would sink deep in us. It would reframe the way we think about what it means to know you. We just declare in these moments that true blessing is found in saying yes to who you are as the Father reveals you to be. We ask as a church that you would continue to clarify our focus, clarify our vision, clarify our purpose. that we would see you as you are and we would worship you as you are. So church, as we conclude these talks and what it means to know God through Philippians chapter three, it's our time now to respond to his word to respond to the invitation, to respond to the call, because you didn't initiate the idea of desiring to know him. He started it. He initiated it. So as a church, as the people of God, we are going to respond to him and say, God, I want to know you as you've been revealed to be. if that's you, I just want you to stand up to your feet. We're going to respond in these moments and we're going to declare as a church, as a bride, that God, I want to know you as you are. I want to know you deeper than I've known you before. I want to love you more than I've known you before. This is our time right now to respond to the word of God, to respond to his heart. Holy Spirit, come. Spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we might know you more. Can you just put your hands out in front of you in a posture to receive, in a surrendered position to say, God, I give up what I think I know of you and I cling hold to how you're revealing yourself to be.